Society of Edinburgh, and until recently I was director of Glasgow University's Crichton Campus at Dumfries. Um, it's my great pleasure and privilege tonight to uh, chair this session with the two gentlemen on either side of me as the speakers. So like you, I'm just here to listen. The idea is that each of them will speak for about half an hour, 
We will then have questions and discussion among ourselves. Um, I was supposed to get instructions which I've forgotten. Uh, can we take, no, we have to tell people the fire exits are here and there, right? Is that right? Yeah. And toilets are there and here. Anything else? No? Right. Um, these are very serious matters. I should not be frivolous. Pardon? Switch off mobile food. Oh, yes, that's right. Switch off mobile food. Anything else? Anybody would like to add to the list? Uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh likes to think of itself as Scotland's National Academy. It uh, promotes huge amounts of research in the sciences, the arts, um, engineering, uh, languages, exchanges with other countries. It has large pockets for uh, funding of research of all sorts uh, all over the country and indeed increasingly all over the world in partnership with other national academies. Um, it's making quite a big splash. Last year it ran a project on our growth where it looked at various aspects of the town, the borough, um, things like identity, environment, uh, economic possibilities, etc., etc. And this year, I'm very happy to say, it decided it would do a project on Dumfries and Galloway. Doing a project, of course, on a region this size is a bit different from doing one borough in Angus, uh, and this one extends from Langham to Stranraer. Uh, this, this is part of a series which is going on in various communities uh, across Dumfries and Galloway uh, between now and the end of the year, at the end of next year, the end of next summer. Um, so, tonight, uh, S. Dale's greatest son, without a doubt, and indeed one of Scotland's greatest uh, achievers, Tom Thomas Telford. Tommy Telford, as they like to call him in this part of the world. Um, and just very quickly, and these gentlemen have already been warned that we don't really have time to say too much about each of them. Needless to say, because they're on a Royal Society programme, they are extraordinarily distinguished individuals. First of all, on my left, Professor Roland Paxton, um, who's uh, written a lot of books and articles about Thomas Telford in his time, amongst um, very many other things. He's from the Department of the Built Environment at Harriet Watt University. And on my right, Brian Veach, Director of Arup, um, a very distinguished uh, civil engineer and uh, uh, something, well, I, I've only met him, but you know, just talking to him, I believe, something of a prophet, perhaps. What we're going to do is we're going to hear from Roland on Thomas Telford and his achievements, and then Brian is going to talk to us about sustainable engineering in the present, where we're going from here. So would you please welcome um, Professor uh, Roland Paxton on Thomas, Car Thomas Telford. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a particular pleasure for me to come here to Langham to tell you just a little bit about Thomas Telford. He was born in 1757 at Glendinning, and he died in 1834. So if you can get your minds around that, 1757 to 1834 is the time frame for what I'm going to be talking about. Now, this uh, picture was from my old friend, late friend, Kenneth McRae, and he maintained that this was uh, the site of uh, the, the Bothy, or the, the little place where Telford was born at Glendinning Farm. I think he thought it was in the, in the mound in the foreground. Now, Telford wasn't uh, only the greatest civil engineer of his age, he started off in a humble way uh, as uh, a lad in Eskdale uh, and uh, became a stonemason. And here you see uh, the headstone to his father's grave, which he cut himself. And I've put that there because you can see was in fact um, an earlier Thomas Telford who died in infancy. This was often the way that um, 
They used the same name if the first child in the family died. So there were two Thomas Telfords, as you can see from that gravestone. Well, I mentioned that he uh, started his professional life as a stonemason, and this is the bridge which is very familiar to you all just outside here. And uh, Telford worked on this as a, a trainee stonemason. And some years ago, I spent a long time trying to find his mason mark, and I think you'll see if you look at that uh, very carefully, you'll see an arrow with a lozenge at the top and a cross halfway along the shaft. If anybody can find that now, um, I think they deserve a bottle of whiskey. I couldn't find it again, but I did photograph it when I found it the first time. In fact, I was a bit suspicious about it and wondered if one of the locals had perhaps put it there, but um, it's not quite the same as the one that showed in Smiles, Eyes of the Engineer. Well, this is just to, to show you that um, Telford outgrew the opportunities to be a stonemason in this part of the world and went to Edinburgh to work on the new town of Edinburgh. Uh, that picture, in fact, is a <coughs> slightly later one showing the end of the Union Canal for which Telford, in his later life, was consulting engineer. Well, Edinburgh wasn't able to hold him for very long. He was there for just over a year. That's where he learned how to draw and... Uh, and prepare himself to become an architect. He then went to London, and that is Somerset House, and I believe he worked uh, as a stonemason on the left-hand end of that building. But his earliest known drawing was this ruins of the Roman bath at Roxeter, and that drawing is dated 1788. I don't think many of you have seen that before. That's Telford's, as far as I'm aware, earliest surviving drawing, 1788. He then went to Shropshire and had a very powerful patron in uh, William Johnson, who became Sir William Pulteney, who was heiress to the Earl of Bath and reputed to be the richest commoner in England. So with, with Pulteney's patronage this helped Telford to get on and he became County Surveyor of Shropshire and here you see his design for Bridge North Church which is a mixture of styles but uh, quite attractive to look at and we're talking about 1792 now and there you see the interior, it's nice and light and airy. So Telford has now um, dropped his stone masonry and is now an architect. And he did various um, architectural improvements. Even in this uh, part of the world, as well as down in Shropshire mainly. So that's the interior of Bridge North Church. Now for Sir William Pulteney, um, he did a lot of work for the British Fisheries Society. This was one of Sir William Pulteney's favourite projects. And here you find Telford doing the, working on all the various little buildings in Ullapool and the sort of gridiron pattern of the streets. Again, this is still in the 1790s. He also then went on to work at Wick, similar sort of thing. Pulteney Town, Wick, and he worked on the two harbours at Wick, which you can see in that image. One of the most charming uh, parts of Wick but for me is to look at the Argyle Square. This is typical of the, again, Telford's architectural uh, layout of the cottages for people of Wick. Well, to come back.
back to Shropshire again, he designed for the County Surveyor a number of bridges, and this is his first bridge, which is the Montford Bridge. We're looking now at 1790 to 1792, a fairly chunky kind of bridge, you see. Um, substantial masonry arch but it's still there and still carrying main road traffic a much more architecturally attractive is this bridge at Butley which is still over the seven inch option and I think you'll agree it's much more handsome in an architectural way well Telford uh, revolutionized uh, structural design using iron and here you see his first use of uh, cast iron in the form of beams and this is for the Shropshire Canal sorry the Shrewsbury Canal and that's uh, 1795 and then he went on to do the Cherk Aqueduct on the Ellesmere Canal and then followed this up with Bonkisalti Aqueduct on the Ellesmere Canal, which in my view was the, the greatest structural engineering achievement of the canal age. You can see there, um, whenever I go there, I insist on travelling across it on a boat, and you can see there the drop on the right-hand side of that boat is about 126 feet down to the River Dee. It's absolutely astonishing that that structure, which was completed in 1805, is still in very extensive use today. Well, this was Telford's original drawing for uh, for the Pont Casalti Aqueduct. And you can see there that um, it's on the the principle of the earlier Longdon on turn aqueduct at the bottom but if you look at the bottom you'll see that underneath the, the flat part of the beam you'll see a cast iron arch and this was put in as a, a form of um, support for building the trough above it so the whole thing is over a thousand feet long and it really was um, deserving of its um, modern uh, well, they, they now call it a, a World Heritage Site. But in structural engineering terms, it was quite unique and state-of-the-art in 1805. Telford did the buildings along the canal. There you see the local pub. He was very good at doing inns and uh, schoolhouses and warehouses. This, in my collection of Telford artefacts through the years, one of the most interesting things I ever found, and I think this is the only known example of it, is a wax seal, sealing ring that he had. And you can see on this, he used this to seal his letters. And you can see that it's got the Ponkisaltian Cherk aqueducts and the initials TT on it. As far as I'm aware, um, that, that's the only one I've ever seen. Well, Telford uh, did a number of major road schemes. This is his scheme uh, across New Galloway. This is Kakubri, rather, 1808. Now, his iron works all <coughs> stemmed from the Colebrookdale Bridge, which is the Wells first major iron bridge this dates from 1781 Telford looked at this when he became county surveyor a little bit later and then looked for an opportunity to apply engineering principles to develop the use of iron further and what he did a place called Bulldrass, not many miles above Colebrookdale was to introduce this quite remarkable design which is a fairly flat cast iron arch with a, an outer beam to um, give it additional strength. According to my calculations, he didn't really need the outer beams, but there's no doubt at all it would 
help to uh, strengthen the cast iron arch. So here we find Telford using cast iron in a much more structural engineering way than the original Colebrookdale bridge. The, the span is 30% um, greater and the amount of iron in it is 50% less than at Colebrookdale. This gave Telford such confidence that he was able to produce this design of 600 feet span. Now, this is very remarkable because uh, building bridges in stone, the maximum spans that had been achieved up at that time were about 100 feet. So Telford was able to use his expertise on uh, cast iron to produce this design of 600 feet. It was never built, but um, in my view, uh, it probably could have been made to work, perhaps not just quite in that form. So this was a design of 1800. You can see that Telford actually increased the spans achievable for bridges from about 100 feet to approaching 600 feet. In masonry, this is his Tonglen Bridge, which uh, whenever he had an opportunity, bearing in mind his architectural background, he loved to introduce a Gothic element into the design. And you can see on this design for Tonglen Bridge, you can see pointed arches and castellations. And uh, this bridge is, is um, still carrying modern traffic and uh, has a little plaque put on it. So we're still in the early 1800s. That's not very clear, but um, you can see uh, the extent of his works throughout Scotland. Starting at the bottom, you can see the Glasgow to Carlisle Road. Carlisle's right at the bottom the picture and shown in red with the Lanarkshire Road across here. And this also shows um, the Caledonian Canal higher up and something like a thousand um, bridges and a thousand miles of highland roads. Again, um, with his cast iron, in 1810, he, he actually modified his design into this bridge at Bonner Bridge, which um, was the first of the major cast iron bridges in the Highlands. So again, the span of this bridge was 150 feet, which was 50% greater than could have been achieved using a stone bridge. That was his design for the bridge over the River Ken, the same sort of design. And the bridge at Craig Elke. We've now got up to 1814. And a better coed in North Wales on the A5. This was his timber bridge for Kakubri and his stone bridge which wasn't built for Carlisle. And coming to the many highland bridges, this is the, this is the bridge at uh, Glen Shiel, which is typical of, um, of, of Telford's highland bridges, one of the larger spans. And a Dunkeld bridge, is the largest of all his highland bridges, very handsome bridge. It has hollow spandrels. And I managed to persuade the bridge engineer to open up the bridge and let us have a look what they look like, and that's what it looked like inside. I don't think anybody had been in it since 1808. You can see it looks rather like Santa's Grotto. Of 
And we now come to the Caledonian Canal, just very briefly. And that little mound at the back is Ben Nevis. And this canal went all the way up from Fort William to Inverness and went right across Scotland. And that's the Corpac Sea Block. That's the, what they call Neptune's staircase at Vannevar. These were the largest um, canal locks in the world at that time, designed by Telford and William Jessup. Neptune's staircase. This is a ship in Loch Oig. It's strange, isn't it, to see a sailing ship in Loch Oig being towed through by a large rowboat. The canal was designed to be 20 feet deep, but in fact, when it was opened, it was only about 14 feet deep. They had great difficulty in, well, they couldn't in fact achieve a 20 foot depth all the way through, although all the locks were actually built 25 feet deep. So at the right hand side there, you see the central section of the Caledonian Canal and Loch Ness. And that's the turn bridge at Moy. The locks empty, uh, locks at Fort Augustus. The most amazing thing to me about the Caledonian Canal is the, the um, top end of it where it goes into Loch Bewley. You can see there the difficulty there was that Telford had to get out from the, from the shore right out into the deeper water because he needed to have a lock just 25 feet deep. So he had to build all that on a very soft foreshore by pre-consolidating clay which he brought by railway from an adjoining um, source of clay just to the right of the picture. So this was, this was, um, it was so soft the material that uh, Telford was able to take an iron bar of one inch diameter and just using his own force of his arm, it said he was able to thrust it down 50 feet into the, into the soft um, mud and sand. So he had to build a lock on top of that. So what he did was to uh, load up the, the lock that you see at the end in the Beaulieu Firth with all the stones that he was going to use to build the lock and it forced down uh, the clay about 13 feet and then he built the lock in the material that had been compressed. So this was quite an amazing technique. Well, just to look at some of his other works, this is the, um, these are his canal schemes in the Midlands of England. So Telford was canal engineer to about 30 different companies. So he was very much involved including the major canals. This is the Birmingham-Liverpool Junction Canal, Harecastle Tunnel, which is 3,000 yards long, was built in, in just three years. An amazing achievement. These are just some of the structures on that canal. That's the Lee Bridge. And Telford was, the great thing about Telford in his civil engineering design was that he went for the direct line and level. And you can see there the very steep slopes that he put on that canal. This was to avoid lockage, so to make it cheaper to move good, good goods between Ellesmere Port and Birmingham. And look, at the height of, look at the height of some of his bridges there to achieve that. And then Ellesmere Port was the interchange between the canal and seagoing ships. It was the largest in the country at that time. Not to forget Scotland. We have the Union Canal that I mentioned earlier on in Scotland. This is his Avon Aqueduct on the Union Canal. He was a consulting engineer for that. Not only did he work in this country, but he also worked in Sweden as consulting engineer for the Gotha Canal, which you see there. Uh, for which his valuable services uh, earned him 
the title of Sir Thomas Telford from the King of Sweden, which he tried to refuse, but he was told that it was a done deal. So all his letters, if you look in London, at the Institution of Civil Engineers, all his letters from Sweden are addressed to Sir Thomas Telford. Perhaps his most uh, substantial dock works was the St. Catherine's Dock in London, which is in the late 1820s. A really, really sophisticated dock, which enabled different elements of the dock to be um, either filled or emptied, and uh, its access was from the River Thames. It was the most state-of-the-art uh, dock in the country in the late 1820s. Well, as regards to roads, you see there just radiating from London, these were all road schemes that Telford was responsible for doing road surveys for. And in the case of the road between London and Holyhead, uh, he was uh, the overall engineer for the creation of this very important connection between uh, London and Dublin. And it took 1815 to 29 to do this. He introduced a manual which all the town bank trusts had all the way along that road. He introduced general rules for repairing roads. This was also marketed at the same time as McAdam's book on road making which really just dealt with the, uh, the top part of the road. Telford's rules dealt with a road with a substantial foundation as well and uh, whereas McAdam didn't lay down uh, profiles for his roads and gradients uh, Telford did. So this was a very important manual. These are some of the gates and stones that they have on the Holyhead Road. Now this is a wonderful drawing that we have in Edinburgh which shows typical Telford construction. You can see his foundation. This drawing is actually signed Thomas Telford and you can see the, the hand-pitched stones in the road. This particular drawing is 14 Bridge in Edinburgh, which when I first went to Edinburgh was one of my charges for maintenance. Well, this was the site of his, his uh, Runcorn Suspension Bridge, which um, he, developed, he developed a suspension bridge of a thousand foot span by doing something like 900 experiments on the strength of wire in 1814. This wonderful model survived uh, until uh, until about 1906. This was Telford's model, a 50-foot model for the 1814 design. That was the very first uh, design for an iron wire suspension, but it's the earliest one I've been able to find. It was actually made and it was load tested and it survived until about 1906, and it was a 20th scale model of a thousand foot span. There's the thousand foot span. Don't ask me whether that would have stood up in a gale, but um, the difficulty with the early designs were they made the designs so flat that they needed the tension in the cables. Uh, most of the tension was taken up in just supporting the, the, uh, the weight of the cable and it's difficult to imagine it coping with strong wind conditions. Nevertheless, uh, it, that design was improved on, and there's no doubt about the practicability of the design that eventually materialized, which is the Menai Suspension Bridge of 1819 to 26, which was the world's first great suspension bridge, and the model for the development of suspension bridges that took place throughout the whole of the 19th century. It established this genre as the most economic means of achieving the larger spans. His Conway Bridge was built at the same time. You see it sort of sandwiched in there between, between Stevenson's tubular bridge and the modern bridge. This was his bridge over the Esk. You've all seen the metal bridge in when you were going down the A74. That was the original metal bridge, which lasted until nearly a hundred years. Another bridge on the A74. The Dinwoody Toll House, which had very broad eaves. You can see this was, this was to accommodate uh, the birds, maybe. 
are very attractive to see. And the Gretna Green Marriage House, of course, the original one was on Telford's Glasgow to Carlisle Road. And finally, um, you might wonder why I put this on. Telford ne never got married. He um, spent the whole of his life on active service doing all these wonderful improvements. Civil engineering is about um, the art of directing the great forces in nature for the use and convenience of mankind. This definition was actually put forward at the time Telford was the first president of the Institution of Civil Engineers and uh, nobody uh, did more to, um, to actually put that into practice. One of the things he, he did like to do was to attend uh, shows. He wasn't kind of very keen on classical music, but he loved to go and see Dorothea Jordan. And this is one of the one of the plays, the farce that he's known to have visited. That's a typical milestone on the Glasgow to Carlisle Road. Another bridge on the Glasgow to Carlisle Road. <coughs> Telford built many Highland churches, something like um, 31 churches, I think it was, and 43 manses. And uh, this is a development of his masonry bridges at Overbridge, Gloucester. You can see that that's a corn du vache to um, ease the passage of the water under the arch. And for a masonry arch of 150 foot span, that is really a, a classic uh, construction only perhaps exceeded by his Tewkesbury Bridge. You see there, that design is for a 170 foot span, and if we'd had a bridge over the Thames in London, I suspect it would have been um, an ex an ex just a larger version of that one. It's very elegant, it's, it's strong, it still carries main road traffic. It has been strengthened a little, but it's... Um, it's wonderful evidence of Telford's mastery of the use of cast iron with his ironmaster partner, William Hazeldean. That's his bridge over the Clyde at Glasgow, in classical engineering style. And finally, his Dean Bridge at Edinburgh, which uh, when I went to Edinburgh in 1964, I had it opened up. And you can see it's hollow inside. There are seven cavities running alongside the road. You'd be interested to know that uh, although it had been there for nearly 200 years, uh, there were no defects of any kind. We just had to clean out all the pigeon droppings and twigs and things. And uh, that's what it looked like inside after it was cleaned out. And you can actually crawl over the top of each of the four arches on the inside. You can see the flat stone slabs at the top and it now carries something like 7 million vehicles a year and it was built for I think it was 16,000 pounds. You see Telford so developed his masonry bridges, think of that very chunky Montford Bridge and they've got that beautiful slender effect that he's got on the Dean Bridge by bringing forward the arches 5 feet and the pilasters his whole idea was to try and achieve slenderness, and I think you'll agree uh, he certainly managed to, to do that. It seems quite incredible to me that that is the stone bridge. And we just, um, just to mention his harbour schemes, that was um, Aberdeen and Dundee harbours, and it's a wonderful thing that um, he was buried in Westminster Abbey. I think that was a very fitting place uh, for Son of Estill. He didn't particularly want to be there, but his, his colleagues uh, made sure that he was. So I think I've had more than my half hour, and thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>
Um, Brian Veach, as well as being director of ARP, is a um, visiting professor at Glasgow University and also at Strathclyde University. So he's doing his best to keep everybody happy in the great city of Glasgow. And we look forward to what he has to say now. Thank you very much to Professor Paxton for getting us off to a great start and these absolutely magnificent images, um, which are the best way to look at Telford, I think. And that's what speaks for him. Brian Beach. Well, thanks very much, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask you to fast forward with me about 200 years or so uh, from Telford's time. Um, I mean, I, I think that was overwhelming, really. A fantastic, uh, both in terms of the quality and the quantity of, of uh, what one man, one man achieved in his lifetime. Um, I think a lot of what he did would be driven by the circumstances of the time. Um, roads, canals, harbours, um, very much to do with the economic development of the country at that time, um, and perhaps also there were social drivers as well. Um, and I'm going to draw something of a parallel there, because I think I'm going to talk about engineering now and perhaps looking forward a little. Uh, Telford responded to the drivers and the challenges, and I think just now, um, perhaps more than ever in recent times, there are challenges confronting uh, confronting us, and I think engineering has something to offer in uh, meeting those challenges and uh, coming up with some solutions. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about two things, really. I'm going to talk about what engineering, for me, is about right now, and I'm going to then relate that to one of these challenges, the challenge of dealing with climate change and responding to climate change um, at this particular time. So I said I'm going to fast forward 200 years, but if you bear with me, I'm going to pause um, just on the way. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, there's another uh, giant of engineering, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, and, and he, like Telford, responded to the great challenges of his time. Um, again, a lot of them were economic challenges. The building, I mean, this was an amazing man who built, uh, who designed and had built railways, uh, steamships, buildings. Uh, this is his great bridge at Saltash. Um, uh, the, the, the Great Western Railway running from London down into Cornwall, and this is the River Tamar uh, at the, the, um, the, the, the border between uh, Devon and Cornwall. Uh, but again, uh, he was driven by the economic need to improve communications within the country, uh, to connect London with the West Coast and the shipping which was coming in there. Um, he also he extended the concept of what engineering was all about. I mean, engineers are people who know how structures like this bridge behave. They're able to predict um, on the drawing board. Uh, before they're built, they're able to predict how they'll behave and to proportion them so that they will perform satisfactorily. Uh, that's, that's the core of engineering, uh, civil engineering. But uh, Brunel went a little bit further than that. He looked at the circumstances in which these projects would take place, um, and he particularly became involved in raising the finance uh, that allowed these projects to happen. Um, and again, I'm going to draw some parallels with, with that and, uh, and what we do now. So first, just before we get into engineering today, people always ask me, you know, what is civil engineering? Um, it's not readily apparent to most people. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'm going to play you a short video, um, which I think neatly summarizes what engineering is for me and for my colleagues today. Uh, it runs for about three minutes, so just bear with me, um, and then we'll get on to something else afterwards. But I think this will give you a grounding in what it means. Ah. <laughs> well, maybe it won't. <laughs> ah. 
how strange. Okay. Well, we'll move on. Um, the video would have shown you this uh, engineering and all its aspects and, and what it means today. Let me deal with that in another way. Let me show you a little bit about uh, what I do and what my colleagues do. I work for this company called Arup. Um, it's now a global company. It's, it's been in existence for about 60 years. 60 years or so ago, it was a handful of people in London. Um, today, it's, it's 10,000 people around the world. And what we do is, in many ways, it's, uh, it's just a, a, a present-day um, development of what the engineers who went before us do. We're, we're involved with uh, all of the same sorts of things, transport, buildings, uh, all sorts of aspects of the infrastructure needed to support society. So uh, you know, that one includes f f uh, water supply and drainage, etc., 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 these are some of the, uh, the things that we're well known for. On the, on the left of the screen there, Sydney Opera House, most people will recognise immediately. It's become kind of uh, symbolic of Australia. Um, but actually making that work and turning the architectural dream into reality was a huge work of engineering, uh, which took many years and, uh, uh, and, and actually kind of positioned civil engineering and structural engineering which is about making buildings stand up um, for the period going forward top right there is the end of what's now called high speed one uh, the railway line from the channel tunnel into London, this is St Pancras station uh, high speed rail travel fairly topical subject in the UK um, and particularly uh, the possible extension of high speed travel, high speed rail travel north from London uh, to the Midlands and then onwards and perhaps in due course to Scotland. Uh, so we were involved in High Speed One, uh, we were involved in the engineering, we were involved also in aspects of raising the finance to make High Speed One work. Um, we're currently involved in the planning of High Speed Two. In the bottom right hand corner, the, uh, you may recognise if you were a watcher of the Beijing Olympics, the uh, the water cube, uh, the aquatic centre, the blue building in the foreground, uh, and behind at night, the Bird's Nest Athletic Stadium lit up. Closer to home, this is the sort of stuff, uh, some of this might be recognisable, Scottish Parliament, uh, new grandstands for the tattoo in Edinburgh bottom centre, these aren't what's there just now, these are going to be erected next year, uh, the point is they can be erected and dismantled far more quickly. Uh, than what's there just now. Um, and then on the infrastructure side, railways, uh, conference centre, and at the bottom, uh, the two buildings for the 2014 Commonwealth Games, the two main new buildings, Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Uh, on the left, uh, very large new indoor sports arena in Velodrome. And on the right, in the centre at the Scottish Exhibition and Conference Centre, a new multi-purpose arena which is going to be used for games events as well. Um, and then our largest project is now in Scotland, the fourth crossing, uh, the, the fourth replacement crossing so-called. This is a visualisation, the new bridge in the foreground with the, uh, the road bridge, the suspension bridge of the 1960s behind and of course the classic railway bridge beyond that. So these are the sort of things that engineers like us get up to uh, right now. Um, but things have changed, and things have changed fairly dramatically just very recently. Um, there has been very much a gro growing awareness of uh, the way in which the Earth is changing climatically. Um, um, a lot of what we are doing now is in response to that. Uh, uh, these things need no introduction nowadays. Um, wind turbines, uh, uh, renewable electricity generation. A little bit of more, more of that shortly. Um, uh, low energy, uh, low carbon buildings, energy efficient buildings. And actually one of the, we'll come on to just a minute, one of the, the things which we are very much involved in nowadays is... Uh, reducing the amount of energy required in daily life 
um, by making buildings and transport and so on more energy efficient and in generating more of that electricity, more of that energy rather from renewable sources. Um, and so we do, we do low energy buildings uh, uh, but we also plan and hopefully one day we'll build uh, low energy towns and cities and this is one of a number of such cities that we are involved in planning, designing just now in China. This one's called Dongtan, it's near Shanghai. So if we come to today's drivers and I said that with uh, Telford and Brunel uh, they were certainly social and economic drivers I've added climatic to this I could have put environmental and no doubt I could have put one or two other things but there are various things, various factors of work now which dictate really the future agenda for uh, infrastructure development, energy developments in this country and I just want to turn to that now and to, to illustrate how engineering uh, has a bearing on how things will go forward. <clears throat> so social factors first. This is uh, on the left. This is the growth of population, rather exaggerated scale perhaps, uh, over a period from 2000 BC up to the present time and a bit beyond. And as we all know, this is fantastic, uh, uh, and perhaps to many people worrying, uh, increase in world population. But we're currently somewhere in excess of 6.5 billion people at the moment uh, and projected to increase to somewhere around 9 billion or more by the end of the century. And of course the consequences of that on the right um, more people huge movement of population from rural countryside all over the world into cities uh, sometimes into cities like this, sometimes into uh, more affluent western cities. And all the consequences of that, um, the, the energy demands of those cities and the, uh, the sort of congestion and other consequences of creating these huge places. <coughs> At the same time, um, climatically, uh, we have this phenomenon of uh, global warming and I think the scientific consensus is that global warming at least to some extent is man-made um, and usually the correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the rise in average temperature is made and as you can see uh, this, is, this is the increase in carbon dioxide concentration uh, over a period of, of uh, uh, about a thousand years. And again, the very sort of steep upwards shape of the curve into the present day, uh, and you know, climbing, climbing out of control actually at the moment. Um, I asked Roland actually about this earlier. This, this particular illustration, you see the line here, and it says 1769 there. And I wonder if anyone in the audience, apart from Roland, can, can maybe suggest what happened in 1769 to make the line turn up just quite as quickly as it did. Industrial well, Industrial Revolution, actually, it, it was James Watt's work in improving the steam engine, which, of course, was just absolutely at the same time as the start of the Industrial Revolution. So it's the Industrial Revolution um, and it's the, the burning of coal and various other fossil fuels um, and various industrial processes that came along after that which have, have uh, uh, led to this dramatic steepening of the curve. So of course the, the emphasis now is on um, trying to bring that back under control um, and the title of my talk, Engineering a Sustainable Scotland, is partly about you know, how Scotland can deal with this. Um, you know, how can we move from the, the, the slide on the right there into something which is uh, in balance and um, less problematic for the future. So the, 
carbon dioxide and also to some extent methane uh, and some other gases, the so-called greenhouse gases, form this layer above the surface of the Earth, um, which captures, which allows energy from the sun through and captures some of it close to the Earth's surface. Um, and the consensus says that this is gradually increasing the average temperature of the Earth. Um, and I'm not going to go into it tonight, but of course there's a lot of uh, discussion around uh, just what you can do to uh, slow that increase in temperature down and indeed uh, what level should we aim at and so on. Um, most people think that if we do nothing by the end of the century, average temperatures will have risen so high that uh, life as we know it just now on the Earth will not be possible. I don't mean it will, will, will not, uh, there'll be no life, it will just be quite different. And of course the uh, concerns are, are many, but uh, uh, the well-known one is the, the, the melting of the, uh, certainly the North Polar Ice Cap, the melting of the glaciers, rise in sea level. Uh, there are lots of estimates of rises in sea level, but it could be up to around a metre, let's say, uh, which would have catastrophic implications which are now fairly well understood if that were to happen just what, what would happen around the world at that time but there is a problem here um, there's a correlation between a very close correlation between uh, wealth and energy consumption and uh, that's what this slide shows um, up this side here is the consumption of energy per capita. Uh, along the bottom is wealth per capita. Um, and you can see there's almost a, a, a linear relationship from, from the bottom left-hand corner here going up and up and up. So the most affluent country GDP per capita, USA, you'll see at the extreme right-hand side but also right at the extreme top as far as energy consumption is concerned. Australia not far behind. And then down at this end, uh, the less developed countries, but these countries rapidly developing. And the problem is, or the situation is, as we move along here, and these countries get richer, we also move up this way, and they also uh, require more energy to support their new lifestyle. Um, and the issue really is around how that energy is going to be, uh, where it's going to come from. Um, you know, will it be renewable? Uh, will it be polluting? Etc. Etc. So we're, we're we're working against the background of things moving away from us. Uh, there's another correlation, really, between just the 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 density of population and the amount of energy used. Uh, this time in transport, in personal, in private transport. Um, and how this works is that the, the more dispersed the community is, uh, so the American community is spread out over a large area. New York here means New York State, not New York City. Uh, require far more energy per capita for people to get from place to place. They drive by car all the time. Energy consumption is very high. In the bottom right-hand corner, Hong Kong, very, very densely populated. Um, the use of private transport is, is very, very much less. It's down at this level. And the red uh, blob in the middle here is a, kind of, it's a sweet spot. It's a kind of uh, balanced position almost. Um, and you can see that uh, the large cities in different parts of the world tend to occupy that space. So again here, the, 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 the further development of the American model is going to lead to more and more energy use. Um, concentrating into uh, smaller, more densely populated, but not over densely populated cities is going to reduce that quite significantly. So there, as you can see, there are various uh, different things at work here. Um, from an engineering point of view, 
uh, the challenge is really to do something about that um, and, and what can we do and I would just like to finish now by looking briefly at what we can do in terms of uh, particularly in terms of moving to a lower carbon uh, future uh, low carbon equals less carbon dioxide uh, and if the scientists are correct that equals uh, less global warming um, just before we get to that we've also got to consider uh, the depletion of resources this slide illustrates the amount of the surface area of the earth available per capita to support one person on average at different times so 1900 7.91 hectares um, per capita available today it's it's about two hectares per person and reducing so something like 25% of where it was in 1900 and you could see projected reducing down to below 1.5 hectares going forward so again that's another curve we want to get off because um, well because we all run out of things that we need uh, this is about oil um, it shows that the rate of discovery of oil is diminishing um, where, whereas the production of oil and therefore the consumption of oil is increasing as we go forward uh, which is an unsustainable position can't continue forever uh, it's not going to fall apart tomorrow but uh, you know, 50 years plus into the future there will be an issue um, and also food supply uh, more fundamentally and water I think would be on a similar curve you can see the um, the amount of food per person available actually increased uh, to this peak um, and then is starting to come down and projecting into the future down and down it comes um, again we have to get off these curves so engineers will come up with solutions um, in response to this um, this is just a diagram of, of um, you know, how a modern approach to energy might work um, it is very much to do with uh, controlling the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that is going into the atmosphere it recognises this particular diagram that uh, wind turbines aren't going to be the answer to everything and that uh, certain certainly in, in certain parts of the world uh, electricity will be continue to be generated using uh, coal, gas uh, perhaps some oil um, um, uh, fossil fuels in other words um, and of course the big difficulty there is not only depletion of resources but these fossil fuels will uh, release large volumes of carbon dioxide uh, so the plan here, the diagram anyway, is to do with capturing the carbon dioxide um, and, uh, and really storing it underground, uh, probably below the sea. Um, and a lot of work's going on just now, a lot of engineering work and scientific work is going on, looking at how that can actually be achieved. Um, in fact, Scotland is... is it, it, leading in some of the research particularly the Scottish universities uh, leading on that um, at the present time but a lot more to do um, the other response is, is to move to uh, renewable energy generation so we were looking at earlier at um, wind turbines onshore um, and you'll be very familiar with them in this part of the world um, but also uh, solar energy top left offshore wind top right uh, top right is offshore wind and shallow water uh, the future for the North Sea is uh, large amounts of uh, renewable energy being generated by wind turbines in deep water uh, wind turbines which incidentally will be many times larger than what we see just now on land uh, and many times larger than what's illustrated uh, on this slide bottom left tide bottom right wave power um, uh, top left carbon capture and storage uh, and, uh, and bottom right actually 
this is a prototype under development now for one of these new generation of offshore wind turbines um, able to generate perhaps four times as much electricity as a scaled up uh, onshore wind turbine um, and actually more easily maintainable because all the working parts are at low level rather than um, a long way up in the air. Um, so then just, just looking at some of the implications of doing that. The engineering is in, in developing the technologies that make this work. Um, but making, making it possible to deploy these technologies is about uh, various things, um, but chief amongst them is uh, how on earth can we afford to do it? And so, for instance, uh, this is a, just illustrates the development of offshore wind turbines at the top. Uh, number five at the right there is the one we looked at the image of. Um, there are lots of estimates of this again, but um, as kind of middle of the road is that Scotland, over a 20-year period, might need to spend £60 billion pounds to achieve what it wants to achieve in terms of offshore wind in the North Sea. Um, in terms of uh, uh, low carbon energy efficient buildings, uh, there's a huge amount to do here and it's mainly to do, not with the new buildings illustrated here, it's mainly to do with uh, what we call retrofitting older buildings but again there could be another 60 billion pounds to spend there over a 20 year period uh, uh, sustainable transport high speed rail uh, could be 30 billion pounds in total there as well um, and the grid uh, it's no good generating lots of electricity off the northwest of Scotland or the northeast of Scotland when the market is London and the southeast. Um, it's all got to be connected up. And again, an estimated £20 billion pounds over 20 years to do that. So huge sums of money. Um, £140 million in total, perhaps, on the energy things alone. Um, there's another aspect of, of uh, renewable energy, uh, this is a, it's what's called a biomass combined heat and power plant. That's a plant which runs off sustainable fuel sources, uh, usually timber pellets, which are from sustainable uh, sources. So the, the, uh, the forests from which these pellets come are replanted and regenerate. Again, more modest level, two billion pounds. Uh, sustainable cities, one and a half billion pounds. Uh, retrofitting of a typical university campus, not necessarily this university campus, to make it more energy efficient might cost £300 million pounds over 10 years. Um, and preparing the ports and harbours around the, or down the east coast of Scotland. This is a, a recent government study. Uh, the initial investment alone, just to prepare the sites for construction of offshore turbines, £225 million. Pounds. So that money has got to be found from somewhere. Um, uh, who's going to foot the bill? It's very much a current topic. And uh, you know, people are looking at that. This is uh, a snapshot from a recent survey of the investment community. This is private investment worldwide and their interest in participating in financing uh, the sort of development of renewable energy that's required. Uh, you can see the different uh, sectors of, of the, the Scottish Low Carbon Programme along the bottom here. And the height of the, the, the column here represents the degree of interest in these different parts. So um, you know, there's, there's probably here less interest from the investors just now in the offshore renewables because it's viewed as being very risky. Whereas energy efficient buildings are something perhaps better understood. And you see the, the tallest bar there, 70% uh, interest is, is to do with energy efficient buildings. So all this is being researched just now and uh, the engineers are interfacing with government, are interfacing with the investment community to look at ways in which these projects can actually be taken forward. <coughs> Part of that is prioritization. That's basically to do with value for money. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, I know, but basically it's a series of steps in this direction of all the things you might want to do. It always represent steps towards where you want to get to. 
uh, perhaps in terms of reducing carbon dioxide, and the cost of each of these steps is represented by the distance from here up or from here down. And when it's down, actually, it's saying that although it will cost something to put these measures in place, the net cost will be negative. So uh, the most cost-effective thing of all, of course, is this bar here. And I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but it actually says building insulation. It's the most <laughs> cost-effective thing you can do. But there's a whole series of other things there. So prioritization, uh, where do you get best value for money? What should you do first? How should you organize it? Again, engineers very much involved in these issues and um, talking to government about how they should take things forward. Um, there's actually a project in place just now called the Scottish Low Carbon Investment Project, uh, a government project, looking at that. Um, uh, and out of that comes uh, the analysis of the right there, which is to do with the way in which the ports and harbours in Scotland can, uh, can support the development of offshore renewables, the, the purple areas. <coughs> represent the largest offshore wind fields so far licensed around Scotland um, and the little triangles represent the locations of the ports which are well placed to, to, to support them um, and of course on the back of that there's a very important issue of trying to capture as much economic benefit around those ports so that um, they don't just become places where uh, the components are imported from overseas and assembled that we actually start manufacturing and developing the technologies on the back of that manufacturing industry. Uh, on the left here, a recent conference in Edinburgh, which is actually to do with bringing together investors and promoters of these offshore wind projects uh, with the uh, manufacturers and the uh, various other stakeholders, and we are one of these stakeholders involved in ma making this happen. So, a different world from the world of Telford, uh, a very different world, but actually I suspect some of the challenges, um, um, the challenges of today equate in some way to the challenges that, that Telford confronted. Um, I hope that uh, we can do half as well as he did in meeting those challenges. So, this is my last slide. Um, I put it up here because there's a lot of talk about carbon footprints and uh, personal lifestyles as well in connection with this. Um, and you may have got a little handout on the way in here. I hope if you consult this website, which is uh, on your handout, uh, you might find that it uh, invites you to put some data in and actually discover what your own carbon footprint is. So, I'm going to finish at that point. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Um, there's lots of food for thought there. Lots of things I'm sure we'd like to talk about forever. Um, we are, as usual, a wee bit short of time, however. So, there is a roving mic somewhere. Rosine's got a, a mic. Uh, we now invite questions from the audience. Um, if you'd like to use the mic, just raise your hand, please. I'd ask the speakers to make their answers very short, if they could, so we could get as many questions in as possible in the next five minutes. I'm fascinated every talk about how much Telford achieved. How did a man like Thomas Telford organize the teams that worked and how did he actually achieve what he did achieve within the allotted time span? Uh, well, he had the genius for uh, selecting competent people, both in terms of his assistants and contractors. Uh, he was the kind of um, engineering manager par excellence. And um, he seemed to be able to um, inculcate um, a loyalty and competence in his um, staff and his contractors uh, without uh, losing control of the overall picture. So I think it was in his uh, careful choice of 
his team. He was very much just the opposite of Brunel. Telford was a team man, and uh, his great success was really through having these competent assistants and contractors. In other words, he could never have done it if he had to work under modern conditions. You know, the man, the local man who invented the word environment is none other than Thomas Carlyle. It's amazing that these two guys came from practically the same neck of the woods. Other questions, please? Good. <laughs> it wouldn't be that one, eh? <laughs> One of the things that is obvious is that engineers will build anything they're paid to build. And in your talk, you gave us a lovely picture of the new fourth crossing, which many people think goes absolutely against achieving any of the other aims which you laid out in your talk, because it actually encourages uh, motor transport. And in fact, although engineers may have the solution, it's governments that have the ability to force people to change their way of life, which in the end is what's going to happen, either that or war. Yeah. Um, well, I think, as in most things, there are many views about the appropriateness and desirability of the things that we can do going forward. Um, um, and I'm sure you'll be aware that equally there are many uh, supporters of uh, things like the fourth crossing. Um, there are usually arguments on both sides to be balanced. Um, I think engineers do have a place in um, participating in these discussions and reaching a balanced point. But you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, um, engineers are advisors. Um, they are probably... Um, they're probably amongst a group of advisors uh, um, producing a range of opinion on matters such as the one you raise. At the end of the day, um, government usually decides, um, and then the people decide following that. Uh, I think that's the way it is, and it's probably the way it's been for a long time. Thank you. Any other points? Yes, gentlemen. My question to uh, uh, speech would be this. In a relative clause towards the end of your talk, you referred to the fact that projects in the remoter parts of Scotland, including the islands and offshore, should, if possible, include local manufacture. Do you think, and this is a question of how far engineers have a social responsibility or how far they should be encouraging a social conscience uh, over and above purely environmental concerns, that these kind of projects could be in fact the long sought for regeneration of those parts of Scotland which are depopulating, which offer few opportunity employments at present to young people and which really need to be regenerated if at all possible? Um, well, my answer to that is yes, maybe. Um, <coughs> we've been involved, uh, I mean I was talking there about transmitting electricity from where it's generated to where it's needed on the one hand. Um, there's another approach to that. You can actually take the need to where the availability exists. And we're actually looking at projects which take energy intensive uses to where the natural energy resource is located. Um, so that's one way of dealing with uh, uh, or finding solutions which um, deliver economic benefit to those remote parts of Scotland. Um, Scotland certainly needs to find a way of um, stabilizing its situation. Half of the population is outside of the main conurbations, um, and, and a good many of the, those in the, the, the remoter parts. Um, 
One of the difficulties with this is that you very quickly, if you look at it, uh, say it were to do with the assembly or manufacturing of uh, these large offshore wind turbines, which, um, which yes, um, on many criteria, that those activities could take place at some of those remoter locations. <clears throat> but the problem is that um, it may not be sustainable. If you look at what happened in the oil and gas industries, for instance, the oil production platforms, many were, because they required deep water, many of these were uh, constructed at remote locations. Uh, large workforces had to be assembled, temporary work camps were built, etc., etc. Um, but that came and went. Um, and I think that's, that's a route to think carefully about going down in connection with this next round. The, the scale of activity required um, in relation to renewable energy in the, uh, in, the, in the North Sea is very similar to the scale of activity required in relation to oil and gas in the 1970s in the North Sea. And, and many of the operations are going to be similar, not the same, but similar. So it's a yes, maybe, I think, uh, is the answer for me. Thank you. We'll meet with the last question, I'm afraid. Uh, first of all, thank you both for the talks that were provided. Uh, the main question I've got is simply for, for Brian. Uh, the modern kind of idea of deep burying CO2, how viable do you think that is? Because a lot of skeptics will kind of say it's going to just end up like a fizz when you take the lead off a Coke bottle. Um, so how viable do you think that is? Um, honest answer is I don't know. Um, there are lots of people who know more about it than I do who think it's got a sporting chance or more um, but for sure a lot more work has to be done to prove, to demonstrate uh, that it will work and you know, w one of the main worries around all of this is that um, once you have actually captured the carbon, transported it to where you want to store it um, how do you know it's going to stay there? Um, and what will be the implications if it doesn't? Um, and that's something that's very difficult, I think. My perception, anyway, of what uh, the experts tell me about that, is it's very difficult to forecast exactly what's going to happen there. Um, and that might actually, I mean, I was talking about money here, and money is a, a, an enabling factor in allowing these things to happen. <coughs> That uncertainty equals risk, um, and in terms of private investment, risk is not where you want to go necessarily. So um, until those uncertainties are removed, one way of doing that is to sort of work away at it bit by bit and try a bit and see how it goes and try a bit more. But until the uncertainties are removed, uh, the, the, the whole process might be inhibited because the money just won't become available. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have to wrap up at this point, I'm afraid. Um, there is a, another of these lecture series, uh, another in this lecture series at Lockerbie Academy on the 9th of November, Geoffrey Bolton speaking on wind, water and waves, which follows on rather nicely from what we've been talking about. Um, and Alan Little, BBC World Affairs correspondent, will be talking about reporting the world in the age of conflict at Stranraer Academy for the venturesome among you um, on the 10th of December. And there are further talks after Christmas, but you can pick up information about them out there or look at our website. We have to thank uh, the Scottish Government's European Community, the Fries and Galloway Leader, the Buclue Charitable Foundation, the Hollywood Trust, Lloyd's TSB Foundation for Scotland, and the James Weir Foundation for supporting uh, this series um, organised by the, the, the Royal Society. We also wish to thank the Buclue Centre, Langham, for wel welcoming us. A, a sort of final thought, if I may be allowed one, and that is, you know, Thomas Telford had such a social conscience at the same time. The idea of building the Caledonian Canal was to relieve the problem of depopulation in inland parishes. The same in Dumfrieshire. If you look at this period, and all of the inland parishes were losing population because if you didn't have access to the sea, you were dead in the water economically. And they thought of canals exactly like railways later on. That is to say, if you built a canal, you would extend the shoreline by taking it through the middle of Scotland. And they actually planned 
that people would build factories and maybe even towns along the side of the Caledonian Canal. It was a brilliant scheme. He was the only man in history who ever came up with a solution to the so-called Highland problem. But what's interesting about it is it didn't work. They had everything going for them at that time, surplus population, everything else you can think of, and they got the facility, and nothing happened. Go figure. That's the thought to go home with tonight. The last people to thank are yourselves for coming along, and please come to some more of these events. And lastly, our two speakers for two very excellent presentations. Thank you all very much. contribution of the modern, you know, what engineers are doing today, isn't it? I don't know whether they can share that.